Hello folks, welcome back. In our last video, we were looking at the design of a logger for household power consumption. And you know, we did some tests and we uh, came to the conclusion that we, couldn't, we could not assume the uh, voltage of the uh, mains uh, outlet. And we actually have to measure that in addition to measuring the uh, actual current consumption. So uh, we are going to actually going to be going to the drawing board now to look at some of the decisions that uh, we will need to make concerning our overall design uh, and how we're going to go about building this thing before we actually uh, hit the soldering iron. So here we go. So let's begin. We're going to have to measure the voltage and the current of the mains, right? And over here, our mains uh, is uh, 240 volts AC. And uh, so that's what you're going to have to measure. And you'll need a, a system to actually uh, to sample this, right? You have to sample this. So you have sensors involved here, some way of sensing the current and the voltage, and as well as an ADC to convert the analog to digital. That goes to MCU. And MCU, we'll have to discuss what kind of MCU you want to use. But the MCU now needs a COM system uh, to, to send the data over some sort of link, serial, wire, wireless, uh, Ethernet, whatever that is, to a server of some sort. Okay, that could be an MQTT server, um, or MQTT over to some sort of server, or maybe even an SQL server as we are likely to use. And then this will feed some sort of, uh, I guess a web interface uh, is what I'm thinking of right now, uh, that will actually visualize the data. Okay, so we can see the data that's going on here. Now, a couple of things we need to get uh, um, designed. First of all, this is AC, right? So you actually, um, okay, this is 50 hertz where we are. So you get 50 of these cycles. This could be voltage or current. You get 50 of th these uh, cycles uh, per second, right? So each each cycle takes 150th uh, of a second or I guess 0 0.02 seconds. And so you're going to actually have to sample this. So your ADC will be taking samples at discrete points in time like that, okay? Now, depending on how many samples you take, now if you just take one sample every 0 0.02 uh, seconds, you, you might catch it here or here, and that's just not good, all right? So you need to take enough samples um, above the Nyquist sampling frequency. But, you know, uh, I think uh, we can think, okay, we probably need something like eight, 10 perhaps, okay? But let's say you decide that you want to have eight samples per second, that means, uh, per second, that means uh, per, sorry, per cycle, you will actually need 50 of these times 8 per second. So that gives you 400, right? So 400 samples uh, per second will actually give you 8 actual discrete ADC samples per cycle. So okay, maybe uh, that might be enough, that might not be enough, but think about that. So some one of the constraints, of course, is your ADC rate. The other thing that's important, of course, is the resolution, right? So if you, uh, depending on what your full scale is, supposing we're looking at voltage now, let's say your full scale is 256 volts and you have an 8-bit ADC, that means basically, you know, you have, uh, you have one volt resolution, okay? And if you want to have a 10-bit ADC, resolution goes down 0 0.25 to 5 volts. So basically in selecting this thing, you're going to have to decide on your rate and your resolution. Uh, that's actually one other thing that I quickly want to mention because you know you have an MCU here, you're doing all this sampling and if the MCU is busy doing other things, then you have latency problems. You want to be quite uh, on the ball in catching this. You don't want to suddenly get a delay between this, you know, a long latency between these samples. So you know you might want to have something that's uh, DMA capable Right or interrupt driven, just to so that you can sample things uh, on time. Okay, so that might be one way you go about this. So if you want to do this, you're gonna have to find uh, a system. Uh, many of these ADCs are built into MCU, so it may be a quick, quick uh, MCU, something like a TINC, right? But a TINC doesn't have this com, so you're gonna need something else to provide the communications, or some other system. Now this is what we are looking at. Now, I'm proposing that we actually do some pre-processing on this so that we won't have to deal with all these high sample rates and the uh, latency issues. And uh, I would like to use something cheap. TNC is, well, it's cheap, but it's not super cheap, right? So I'm going to use an ESP8266 uh, here, right? One of these. I'm going to put that here. I'm actually going to use a 16-bit 
uh, ADC here, uh, ADS, sorry, ADS 1115. Okay, that's a 16-bit four channel, right? You need two channels, one for this, one for this. This has four channels or two different cha uh, differential channels. So this is what we're actually going to build our system around. Okay, so we'll talk about this as we go. Okay, so let's talk about this uh, a little bit. You know, why are we using this uh, ESP8266 uh, instead of, say, an Arduino or a TinC or maybe even a Raspberry Pi? Well, first of all, this is a very low power and it has the built-in Wi-Fi uh, connection that you, you can use later on. So this is good. Um, it does have an ADC. It has an, a 10-bit ADC on board, but it's only got one channel, so you can't really use that. So, which is why now we're using this ADS. It comes in different sort of boards, but you know, it's actually relatively cheap. So this is cheap, this is cheap, and um, I think we can make it work together. Now, there's some downsides, all right? The, the um, ESP8266, it does a whole lot of things in the background, uh, keeping the network connection up and so on and so forth. So, you know, I don't expect very good latency, so we don't have uh, high reliable, um, you know, uh, ability to, sample at a fixed time. It does have some interruptibility. I'm not sure how well that will work. We'll think about that. Um, also, um, let's see. Well, I mean, there are some other neat features about this, you know, updating this over the air. So basically, we're going to actually have to make that. This will talk to this over I2C. And now, the problem with this particular ADC is that it's actually relatively slow. And the maximum speed it goes to is 860 samples per second. Now, if you look at this, right, if you go along according to the Nyquist sampling theorem, you basically need to have uh, 2F, sampling at 2F, where F is the highest frequency. And so if this is 50 hertz, then you have sample at 100 hertz. And that basically means that you only have two samples within one cycle. That's just not good enough. You know, you really want to have a good sample of the RMS or what they call true RMS. You're going to have to have a lot more samples. And I don't think uh, we'll, be able, we'll be able to do that with this and uh, while, you know, getting away from this latency problem. So we're actually going to have to do something else. You have to pre-process the AC to feed it through some kind of sample hole rectification, which uh, is something that we have to build uh, using op-amps, right? So we'll do that. We'll look at uh, the SPICE uh, simulation for that. But essentially, we're going we're gonna to try and make it work with this. This is cheap. This is cheap. If the whole thing blows up, you know, I think I can still uh, afford uh, to rebuild this whole thing, right? So this does most of what we have. So we're going to have to work around some of the problems. We're going to look at the code now. We're going to look at some code as to how we're going to make this whole thing work. Obviously, the other thing this will need is to have a real-time clock, okay? So we need to have some way of uh, getting time on this thing so that when you sample, you know what when that sample took place, okay? So that's the other thing. We, we probably have to put in an RTC somewhere in here at some point, okay? So we're going to look at this and go to the code now. Okay, so the first thing we want to do is uh, we have to set up the IDE. We're using the Arduino IDE here, and uh, you, you have to you know, set up the uh, ESP8266 board in your preferences. And uh, once you add that, actually, you can find information on this on the web. Then you have this board in our case, our board is the Huzza board, all right? You can use other boards too, but they're mostly the same. But this is the particular one I'm using, Adafruit Huzza. So in this code, you know, as if you are familiar with Arduino, you know we have a setup section, and in our setup section, basically I start with uh, setting the uh, the hardware, uh, the watchdog timer. I want it time out eight seconds. You know, could put it shorter, but you know this is just what I'm using right now. And um, this is some other stuff. Uh, let's ignore that now. So you have your usual. You initialize your serial port to one one five two hundred baud, and um, you wait for you know wait for that to come up. You do a little bit of delay. Initialize some some pins for input and output. We'll talk about that more later. And then here I'm actually not using the wire uh, function uh, wire library. I'm actually using a separate brzo library, which is um, someone wrote this and uh, it's actually machine code. So it's probably a little bit faster, lower latency. Now the um, ESP8266 does not have, well, at least it doesn't provide for us the hardware I2C uh, port. So, you know, everything's bit bang. So you can basically use any uh, free pins to perform your uh, SDSCL functions. So what this does basically is attempts to read from the, um, 
it attempts to read from the ADS1115 and if it gets something then it will say okay you know the ADC is present otherwise it says it's not present sets a boolean flag uh, just to indicate that if it is present it will actually configure this we'll look at the configuration uh, in just a bit but basically that's what it does uh, most of it most, most of the settings are just basically default okay most of the settings we're using a default okay uh, sing in single ended mode so now we have the usual you set up the uh, you know print some messages you set up the wi-fi i've got a function for that it checks whether the wi-fi is connected or not and if it's not it'll connect if it is it'll leave it alone and then we call uh, we actually have a function where it actually connects to the ntp server to get the time so you know because you know we said that we needed time uh, a timestamp for our sample so what this does it connects to uh, a time server it gets a time and it maintains the time in that uh, internal clock now i also wrote something for a hardware rtc just in case you know uh, maybe the wi-fi is not working or maybe something else not going right so i actually have a backup this is not strictly necessary uh, i think in most cases this will work but you know just for fun we'll put that in and um okay we will ignore some of this um uh, other defines but let's kind of go down here okay so basically you wait for the clock to reach zero seconds before actual actually starting to sample so it try to keep track of uh, when it doesn't start anywhere uh, in the minute it just waits till the um, it, it gets to zero seconds and that's when it starts okay so it'll print some date some other stuff there okay then you get to this loop so this is what actually runs over and over again right but before we do this, actually, what we need to do is we need to actually look at this sync clock function because what this does is it sets up um, an interrupt routine, interrupt service routine. And uh, that interrupt service routine is up here. Let's have a look if we can find it here. Okay, this is the one. This function gets called every time. Uh, and and if, you, if you look at the sync clock function, I tell you what, let's just go look at the sync clock function if I can find it. Um, no, it's not there. Cry keys. I don't know where I put that sync clock function. Okay, here we go. So basically what it does, okay, uh, it, it detaches anything from that particular, uh, if it does some ISR, it disables it. It waits till it's zero seconds, right? So if it is, then it'll actually uh, attach the, uh, well, do I have this twice? Really? Well, this needs to actually be, uh, <laughs> sorry about this. I need to correct this a little bit instead of detaching it twice. Okay. So what it does is actually uh, it will configure it and then it will immediately attach it, right? Now this sample period, right, it tells you how often this particular uh, function will call. So it's, right now we've got it set it, uh, it's called um, every, let's see, what is our sample period anyway? Um, that's fine. Sorry, sample period. Okay, let's find previous. Okay, currently we've got it um, defined at previous 100 milliseconds. Okay, so currently our interrupt routine is called, um, well, 10 times a second. 10 times a second is when this, this routine is called, right? So I think, uh, I think we can we can imagine that you know once you set up the clock every 100 milliseconds it'll actually call our our interrupt function which is this one okay so what does what does it do when it calls the interrupt function um just ignore all the commented out stuff it'll actually toggle the led okay just so that you know the thing is alive i've got an led on the uh, esp8266 board so this will toggle it it reads it and whatever the state is it just toggles it so basically with this going you will see the led flash at um i guess five times a second because you know you have turned on once turn off twice so half of your your interrupt rate which is uh, 10 hertz this it will flash at five hertz okay so you have that led going and then okay you some you actually read so you have two functions that actually read uh, the uh, well i guess this is set up in single ended mode so it reads channel one uh, channel zero and channel one one for the volts one for the amps and then after that you know it 
actually computes the actual wattage, right? And it does this, okay? 10 times a second, it just adds it up, and once a minute, it averages all of that. Once a minute, it averages all of that. Now you might wonder why don't we, uh, why don't we just, you know, uh, do it? Why don't we just send the data out uh, at uh, 10 hertz? Because you do this, basically you're sending out one sample per minute. Well, one, if you're sending data over the network, I don't want to congest the network. I don't want to tie up the uh, my SQL server, which is what I'm using. Uh, so basically, this would aggregate the data for one minute, 10 times a minute, and then once a minute, it will send out the data. So you get a little bit better, um, I guess, uh, estimation of what actually happened during that uh, 60 seconds, all right? So here we go. Okay, so, so you set a flag. It sets a flag, the data is ready. Now, I didn't want to do too much in the in the ISR, in the service interrupt service routine. I want to keep it short and simple, but once it sets the flag, uh, the main loop here, which is running continuously, will notice that the flag is on. If it notices the flag, okay, let's just go through this now. Okay, this is the main loop. Okay, it sees that um, okay, this bit is just resyncing. If, if the clock is out, okay, for whatever reason, and sometimes it might drift or whatever it is, it will actually resynchronize it. That happens only once, rarely. Okay, so we can ignore that. Um, we have a loop here. We, uh, we feed the uh, watchdog. Just make sure it doesn't time out. It checks if the uh, Wi-Fi is connected. If it's not, then it will reconnect. If it reconnects the Wi-Fi, then uh, it will also have to re-establish connection with the uh, SQL server. Okay, so that's that's that. And then we have the clock. If it's uh, if the Wi-Fi is in fact uh, connected, and the clock has not been set, then it will try and set the clock. If it has been set, you know, it leaves it alone, okay? So now we get to this bit, if data is ready. So if the uh, interrupt routine flags that, you know, you have, uh, you have uh, the data for one minute, uh, one minute's worth of data is ready, uh, it will actually, you know, it will actually just trigger this whole routine, right? It checks the clock again. Now, if the clock is not valid, you know, it will send the, um, it'll construct the um, data, it'll construct, construct the SQL instruction uh, command with the now function. So it gets a time from the um, SQL server itself. Okay, assuming the SQL server is running on a machine with uh, a valid time set. Uh, this is really a fallback. Uh, otherwise, it will just use whatever time is built in, okay, from now. Okay, now SAM is the, is the uh, time the sample was taken at. So then the whole bunch of printing of status stuff, right? And at, at the very end of it, we'll say once a month, it will recheck the time if all else works. This is going to be running nonstop, okay? We'll look at um, just a little bit more stuff, the configuration, okay? Basically, you set the thing up with 400 kilohertz um, clock speed on the I2C bus, and you, okay, you have to set this up, these two bits here, uh, the what they call the high threshold and the low threshold register so that you can actually set uh, uh, cause the ready pin to trigger when the conversion is complete otherwise you don't really know when the conversion is completed you can uh, you can use the uh, other fruit library which actually just delays all right now this will get you uh, exactly you ha won't have to wait any longer than you have to wait because you know you don't want uh, your interrupt service routine to take a long time longer than necessary anyway so after that, it sets up the rest of it, mostly default stuff, 127 samples a uh, second after one conversion. Okay, so we will look at the read function. Read function basically takes channel, it, you know, it configures the, uh, uh, the register, tell which channel it is that you're trying to read. Okay, it sets that up. And then it will actually read, read a pin. Okay, so the pin from the, from the um, ADC, the one, the ready pin, is now set up so that whenever the conversion is completed, it will go high. So in this case, you know, uh, well, let's see, it will actually go low, right? So as long as it's high, it will wait. The moment it goes low, so this potentially, this bit here, 
uh, if something goes wrong with the connection, this could actually lock out. But you know, then the uh, watchdog will kick in and reset your whole machine. All right. Um, so once you do that, you actually read the buffer. You configure the buffer back. It sends you uh, sends back. Uh, I guess in this case, uh, sixteen bit. Yeah, a sixteen bit number corresponding to your ADC result. Okay, so essentially this is what happens. It sets the whole thing up. It does a whole bunch of other stuff, uh, a lot of backup. You know, I mean, it opens up the SQL. Uh, it writes to the SQL, and if the SQL server is for for whatever reason it's not responding, it will actually write to a, a temporary buffer file. And when the SQL comes up uh, again, it will you know you'll offload all that buffered data to it so that you don't lose any data if possible. Okay, so I mean, a uh, bunch of stuff and we actually will write this now and I'm going to actually do this. I'm going to set the, um, okay, let's see. I'm going to get the machine ready. Let's see, okay, good. So we actually, we're going to uh, send this out. Okay, so now it's compiling and it will send this whole thing over to the uh, ESP and I'll show you the uh, setup on the breadboard in just a second. We really don't need to see all this, but you know, I've got it all set up. So let's just see if there are any errors. Hopefully there are none, okay? Now I have to say that this particular point in the development, I don't have everything set up. The uh, I haven't actually um, created the uh, database in SQL, uh, in my SQL server just yet. But that's easy to do. I just want to make sure that this whole thing actually works, right? So when it comes up the LED, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll look at the board right now. Okay, so we're going to go to the board. Okay, so we have a board, a uh, whole thing breadboarded up here. I'm not using the Huzza just yet. Um, this, they're all the same, uh, mostly, right? This one has a built-in um, serial, USB to serial converter, but uh, this one does not, so you have to use a separate one for that. This board here, this purple colored board, that's the uh, ADS-1115, slightly different board, but basically um, the same thing, uh, low, low profile. Now here you have the real-time clock, it's a DS-3231 real-time clock, uh, ignore this for a moment. On this side, you have uh, just a power supply, okay? so. So basically, this is what you are working at with. Now, I have both both of these are I squared C devices, and they have built-in pull-ups on their respective boards, so I don't have to worry about that. But here, I have two separate buses. I actually put them on two separate buses. Uh, they're bit bang, so they're okay. But uh, the reason why I did this was because you know this guy kept, gets caught on an interrupt basis, right? So it's quite possible for for an interrupt to occur in the middle of. Uh, an I squared C transaction with the real-time clock. So I didn't want that conflict to happen, so I put them on separate buses. And this green wire here is the ready uh, pin that tells the uh, ESP8266 that the conversion is complete, right? We talked about that earlier. So when you turn it on, what happens is the status light, I had to modify this board a little bit. It comes on uh, just to show that power is on, but you know, once and right now it's actually connecting to Wi-Fi, right? And it's waiting, it's waiting for the uh, um, zero seconds to occur. And once zero seconds occurs, this light will start blinking, okay? So I'm just gonna wait for a little while, it will start blinking shortly. Hopefully, I mean, the longest you have to wait is one minute. Okay, well, it just seems like maybe we caught it at a longer time. But there you go, okay? So it's blinking, we know that the interrupts Working this going at five hertz as we said before, uh, it's actually reading that and so it's working. The the hardware aspect of it, uh, well, the the microcontroller aspect of it is working. We've uh, looked at uh, some aspects of this design. Uh, in the next video, we'll be looking at the um, the uh, sample hole rectifier for the AC to help us to measure the actual current. I'm actually waiting for the sensors. Much of this, uh, many of these things, I'm actually ordering off Banggood. Uh, and uh, they take a long time to arrive, but you know, I'm hoping they will arrive and so we can get on with the actual uh, design. There are quite a number of other aspects of this design that we have not talked about, but you know, here's the call to give you an idea of what, uh, what we are looking at. So we'll talk about the um, actual sensing, the uh, sample hole rectifier, 
the power supply you know how are we going to actually power this thing because the the uh, box you know the mains uh, switch box is way up there uh, near the ceiling so you know find a way to do that easily put that into the casing set up the MySQL server and then we'll talk about the visualization so we've got a couple more videos to go but uh, we're going to actually get on with uh, part of the design and so next video looking at LT Spice.